Much of Scottish folklore centres around the fairies and the odd creatures that can be found hidden away in the quiet parts of the world. But there exists a force that is more powerful than any fairy or any god for that matter. Some say this entity is a being of balance, while others suggest that it is evil. One thing we know for sure is that when death rides out, all respect the reaper's coach. Sometime during the early 19th century, in the land of Balater, to the west of Aberdeen, there lived a family by the name of MacDonald. These MacDonalds were known to live in an old wooden caravan by the side of the River Dee. The great caravan known as the Evening Star at present housed three generations of MacDonalds. The youngest was a 12-year-old boy named Johnny. And even at that age, Johnny earned a living independently from the family by hunting local game and trading it in the surrounding villages. It happened that on one night, Johnny had been out hunting far from his home. Unfortunately for the boy, his hunt was unsuccessful. And after hours of chasing deer many miles across the land, he was almost too tired to walk. It had got to the point where he was worried that he would not be fit enough for the return journey. It was then he saw the lamps of a coach in the distance, and chancing his hand, the boy stood on the road and attempted to flag it down. Along the road came a magnificently ornate black and gold coach being pulled by six elegant white horses. The extravagant coach slowed and pulled up alongside Johnny. The coachman was a giant of a man, well over six foot, but thin and gaunt as if half dead. He wore a fine black suit and a dark travelling shawl pulled up over his head. Johnny, almost regretting his decision to halt the coach, tentatively told the coachman of his weary day and his long road home. He then asked that, if possible, could he ride along with the coach for some time? The grim coachman said, You may ride up here, next to me, but the collections must be made. The tall figure made room for Johnny, and the young boy climbed aboard the coach. At the call of their master, the horses began to pull the coach down the road. And it was only then that Johnny noticed a woman sitting behind him within the black carriage. But from the box seat up front, the boy could not see her face, and before he got the chance to look closer, the coach pulled into a small village. There, standing in the street, was a stout woman, dressed all in white, who seemed to be awaiting the coach. Johnny, being of good manners, greeted the woman, but she coldly ignored the boy, and without a word, climbed inside the carriage, which quickly took off again. The coach then stopped at a small farm in the countryside, where an old man stood waiting. Once again the boy greeted the man, but was ignored as the man entered the coach. It seemed odd to Johnny that none of the passengers would greet each other upon their arrival within the coach. They climbed aboard and sat in an eerie silence, which was beginning to worry the young MacDonald. The next passenger was the strangest yet. The coach stopped in a thickly wooded glen, and out from the trees a young beautiful woman appeared. It seemed to Johnny as if she had been crying, but now she just walked over to the black coach in the same haunting manner as the other passengers. With the carriage almost full, the boy thought there would not be many more stops that night. Onward the brilliant horses pulled the coach, and throughout this whole odd affair, the coachman never seemed to move or even talk. At least that was true, until the carriage came to a halt in another small village, but this time there was no one waiting. After a short time, 
the coachman finally moved. He climbed down from the driver's box and turned a shrouded face towards Johnny. It would appear we are early. I shall be but a moment, if thou wilt wait. Johnny sat for some time, awaiting the tall man's return. But as the night grew colder and the rain began to fall, the shivering boy decided that he would wait in the cover of the coach and so climbed into the carriage. Upon entering, the young MacDonald beheld all of the odd figures he had met that night. Beg your pardon, good folk, said Johnny. I hope you dinna mind if I waked in here for a while. There was no reply to the boy's entrance or question. All within the black coach sat unmoving and deathly pale. Each set of eyes the boys saw were a sea of milky white. Feeling incredibly uneasy, Johnny turned and left the grim carriage. But still looking to get out of the rain, he ran to the small house and sheltered in the eaves. It was there he saw the warm glow of candlelight emanating out of a small window, and as curiosity took the best of the boy, he headed to the sill and peered inside. Within the small room there lay an old man upon a bed. At his side there was a crying woman, and at the foot of the bed a minister was standing, saying a prayer. Johnny heard the minister say to the woman that the man had passed over and was now dead. The woman was horrified, and more tears fell. The minister began to console the poor woman, but just then the door was pushed open and the coachman stooped to enter. With a wave of his thin, bony hand, the corpse arose and followed the dark coachman outside. Johnny stood in shock, but what puzzled him more was that the minister and the woman seemed to have seen nothing at all. It was then that the otherworldly nature of the night's event finally dawned on the young MacDonald. The coachman was none other than death himself collecting the souls of those recently departed. Before the boy could think any more, the coachman was showing the now white-eyed old gentleman onto the carriage. The dark figure then called to the boy, There is one more to be collected in Balater. Johnny was now terrified of continuing his journey with death, so he called to the coachman, I'm fine here. My home's not very far. I'll easy get there myself. Thank you kindly for the lift. The coachman slowly nodded and returned to his post up on the driver's box. Then as he called for the horses to move, a horrifying idea overcame the young boy. He now ran with all haste after the coach and shouted, Far do you cry for the last soul? The coachman was almost out of sight but his unsettling voice made it back to the boy. A home known as the Evening Star. Upon hearing the name of his family's caravan, Johnny's heart fell. His worst thought had come true. With all the power he could muster, he ran towards home, hoping and praying that he could save those he loved. When he finally came upon the caravan, it was consumed in a great blaze of flame. Collapsing upon his knees, the young MacDonald screamed, a most terrible and pitiful scream. All those he knew were lost. It was then, upon hearing the scream of their youngest child, that the mother and father of Johnny peered over a small hill and ran to their son. Moments later, an old man appeared over the same hill. It was Johnny's grandfather. The glee in the boy's young heart and spirit was unimaginable. His family were alive. Never before had he been so relieved to see them all safe and sound. In a manic speech, the boy told them what had occurred to him that night and why he dreaded the worst. Perhaps death had shown favour to him for riding with him all night. It was then that old Grandfather MacDonald spoke. We were lucky, I, but death never leaves empty on it. Ain't of the big Clydesdales that pulls a kelt with kelt in a fire. 
whether the death of the horse was a show of kindness from the reaper, or it was his plan all along, we will never know. And the brave Johnny MacDonald will never forget his coach trip. Or the fact that death never leaves empty-handed. Thank you for listening. And a special thank you to my patrons for supporting the channel and making this all possible. Slang Java.